based on Linux, Android. They're all based on the Linux distribution, right? So it's just, you know, really what, what this has allowed us is, you know, lots and lots of area, lots and lots of people contributing, and lots and lots of people going off and, and doing what they want. These distributions help make Red Hat Linux what it is today. Thanks, I can get off the stage. Oh, I hate being on stage. So now we look at containers. All, right, all of a sudden we get into this container world, and in the container world it's been dominated by one player, or at least people think of it, right? People uh, talk about it. So how do I make Docker containers into just containers? Right, everybody talks about Docker all the time, Docker containers. Everything has to go through Docker. Everything has to go through Docker. So we, mean, we need to make containers as generic as, as PDF. That's really what the goal of all this stuff is. And containers need to be open. They can't be controlled by a single company. All right. So really what I want to do is open up the whole idea of containers so that we can have innovation, more innovation than what's going on right now. So what exactly is a container? As I go through this talk, we're going to be... Uh, talking about, we've been asked not to use the word Docker as much anymore, so I'm going to talk about it as the package formerly known as Docker. Um, so we're going to have TPFKD, which I can't say, so I'll have to probably have to say the format. One of the big pet peeves I have about the entire Docker effort right now is everything has to go through a big, fat container demon. Okay, everybody has to go to the container daemon and ask for permission to do something. If you want to innovate, you have to get your tool, your innovation, into the container daemon. So people have this understanding of containers as being, I have set up this big, huge, fat daemon out there, and I run tools that talk to a client-server operation to talk to the daemons. Well, containers are far more into the Linux operating system than going through this big, fat daemon. What a container is is basically a single process running on a system that has certain kernel configurations set on it. All right, so when I talk about containers, we talk about containers as being something that has resource constraints. So they have certain C groups associated with them. It's a process with certain C group flags set on it. Secondly, a container has some security constraints. Okay, it usually has some kind of isolation. Things like a different SE Linux label might be considered a container, or drop capabilities, Linux capabilities, or um, um, set comp, or right, drop syscalls. And then the third part of a container is namespaces. So namespaces is basically, you, know, you go into your namespace, you view the system differently. You view process tables, things like that. Uh, you might have different mount points inside of your container than other containers, but basically a process that has these namespaces associated with it. If you pulled up a Fedora system right now, booted it up, and looked at PID1, system D, and looked at it, guess what you'd see? System D is in a namespace, right? System D has a mount to go to proc, if you go on your systems right now, go to cd slash proc 1 ns, and you will see a whole list of namespaces. If you looked at it as C groups, if you go to a proc, cat proc, self, uh, proc 1 C group, you will see that system D is running in a C group. If you look at it, it's owned by root. So that's security constraints. Right, it has capabilities. If you look, it has capabilities associated. It has an SE Linux label. It's an NIT. So if you boot up a Fedora system right now, everything is in a container. Right? By the definition of a container, it's just these constraints around it. So only t tools like Docker and other, de other tools are basically just about configuring the kernel and then launching a process with that configuration. So as we go forward, and one of the interesting things I get asked a lot about containers is, can I do, or about applications, is can I do this in a container? And all I say is, if you can do it on Linux, then you can do it in a container, because by definition, everything in Linux is in a container. That's at startup time. Now, the container might have to be running in the host container environment. It might be fully privileged and stuff like that, but yes, you can do it in a container. You can load kernel modules in a container. You can do anything. They're just processes on a Linux system. So let's look at OpenShift Kubernetes. So OpenShift Kubernetes is really where we want to do container orchestration. Right? We want to do container orchestration, but we really want to look at the what are the requirements of, of OpenShift and Kubernetes. So 
So what does OpenShift in Kubernetes need to do to run a container? Well, first of all, we have to have a standard, you know, containers are not just those process things, but they also come with some kind of user space associated with them, right? So when I download a container, if I download uh, the Alpine container from Docker IO, that comes with some user space, right? So what we need, though, is we need a, a standardized way of identifying that, that, that image that we're gonna be pulling down. So we need a standard con contact images. The next thing I need to do is have the ability to go out to a container registry, a place that these things are stored, and pull them down. And that has to be standardized, or somewhat standardized, at least you know, de facto standardized, so that there's an easy way for me to go to container registries and pull down images and put them on my box. Next, I need to take that image I pulled down and I need to explode it onto disk, usually on top of a copy on write file system, just because that's the way people expect containers to work. Um, and then, Lastly, I need to execute that container image. I need to execute the, the software inside of that. So that's, these are the steps that you have to do inside of a container, I mean, to get a container up and running. And then I need some kind of management API, theoretically, to be able to manage that environment. You know, list what containers are running, things like that. But that's optional. I don't need that. So we have a standardized container image format. So a couple of years ago, OCI started up, open container initiative, and open container initiative really went off and tried to standardize two things of the container environment. The first one we're going to talk about here, which is the open, open container image format. So this is basically the things that store container registries. These are the image blobs that we're going to store our container registries. Really all they are is a tarball and JSON, or they're a tarball of tarballs and, and JSON files. That's what a container image actually looks like, um, and mostly what uh, the standardization of the format was basically specifying what the image, you know, what the uh, tarball of tarballs is and what the JSON, the format of the JSON had to be. So this has actually been standardized now. OCI image format um, allows you to store images and container registries. And, and in my opinion, this is the most important thing in containers. This is RPM in Debian. All right? This had to be standardized. If all of a sudden people started to create different container images, we'd end up with you know, uh, you know, people basically having to build applications for different architectures. So the real problem with Linux over the last, or one of the big problems with Linux over the last 30 years is that RPM and Debian never got together. Right? The R Debian format and the RPM format. So anybody that wanted to build applications for Linux had to build to two different formats. So we didn't want that to happen in, in containers, and this has actually prevented that, or hopefully has prevented that from happening. So the next thing we want to do is we want to pull and push images from container registries. So how do I get an Im image from a container registry? Well, I'll give you a little history. This is the first new tool we're going to be talking about. Um, several years ago, we, uh, anybody who's played with Docker, you've done Docker Inspect. Right? So Docker Inspect basically looks at the JSON file that's associated with a container image or with, a, uh, or with the container itself. And you can look at that JSON, and what we added to the JSON is basically some things like labels. So if I go in and inspect a uh, container image, it'll come up and say, oh, this is the Apache container image from Fedora. Um, so there's these nice label things. But the problem with that is we actually wanted to be able to go out to a registry and look at the JSON file associated with images at the registry before we pulled it down. So we actually opened up a pull request to Docker called Docker Inspect dash dash remote. So what we wanted to do is go out to the remote registry, grab the JSON, and pull it down. Otherwise, the only way to look at a container image was actually to pull the container image to your local machine and then run Docker Inspect. So there, there was a huge problem because you'd be pulling down potentially gigabytes of data just to be able to look at it and say, oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Now you have to throw it away. So we wanted that, and Docker basically said no. Um, they said, you should just implement that tool yourself. Don't do it through this. So we implemented a tool called Scopio. Scopio means uh, Greek tool. It's Greek for remote viewing. So the, the original idea was that we'd be able to review, view the JSON associated with an image. Over time, so after we built Scopio originally just to look at the remote image, we said, well, we sort of have implemented a lot of the Docker protocol to, to look at the image and talk to a registry. Why don't we just add in pulling and pushing? So we added pulling and pushing of images from the uh, registry. And then we started working with CoreOS, and CoreOS said, well, they don't really want to use Scopio, but they'd really like to use a Go library to be able to move images back and forth between you know, their environments. So they were looking at it to use Rocket. So they wanted to use Rocket to go out to a registry and pull it down, but they didn't want to execute Scopio. 
So they said, why don't you break it out into a, into a Go library? So we uh, created a GitHub containers image. So GitHub containers image now contains all the uh, libraries and, um, and tooling to be able to move images back and forth between container registries. Scopio then wraps that up, so you can use Scopio as a CLI tool to do it. But we didn't stop it just, so, so traditionally, the only way to move container images back and forth was you'd have it at a container registry and you'd download it to Docker Daemon and Docker Daemon would store it locally. But we started enhancing Scopio and containers image to be able to move images around. So we can actually move images between two registries. We can actually move it um, between dark, two Docker daemons. So we can actually pull it out of Docker daemon. We're going to be talking about some container storage in a minute. So we can actually move images uh, out to local files. We can move them to OCI image bundles. We can move them all different ways with Scopio. And it's all because of containers image. Uh, containers image also is totally being used. Now we're getting contributions from all different vendors that don't necessarily use Docker. So, uh, so Pivotal, for instance, is, is heavily contributing to containers image because they want to use it for the interacting with their, their software. The next thing after we pull the image is we've talked about we had to explode it to disk. So we need to pull the image down and we needed to explode it to disk and onto some type of uh, copy on write file system. And this is really where the big fat demons becomes a problem. So traditionally, we, Red Hat, um, over the time I've been working on Docker, we contributed lots and lots of code into copy and write file systems. Originally because the original Docker only supported AUFS, um, and AUFS only worked on Unix, never got accepted in the upstream kernel, so it wouldn't work on RHEL, wouldn't work on Fedora. Um, so we actually contributed the Butter, uh, ButterFS driver, we contributed the device mapper driver, and we contributed the original version of Overlay, which has been enhanced. So, um, so, there was, so basically all the driver stuff, a lot of that code came out of Red Hat. Uh, and we continued to support it you know, in the upstream. But we basically took all that code and we moved it out and said, really what we wanted to do is, well, let me talk about it a little bit further. So where do I uh, explode my image onto disk? Going back a couple of years ago, we added this command to atomic mount. Did anybody ever play with atomic mount? Okay, you can actually take container images and mount them onto the file system. So then you can go to the mount directory and actually look at the contents of an image. You don't have to run a container on it, but you can take stuff right out of Docker and mount it up. The problem with atomic mount is it was racy, because the Docker daemon doesn't know that you're mounting this stuff out underneath the covers from it. Okay? Docker does all of its locking and inside of its process space. So if another tool comes in and tries to muck around with something, Docker get, can potentially get confused. If you ran this command and then go, went in there and did a uh, Docker RM I of Fedora, Docker's gonna get an error and not understand what happened. Okay, so it's kind of, kind of a racy situation. So what we wanted to do is allow other tools to use storage of the simultaneously with the container runtime daemons. So we wanted to take that uh, tooling out and move it down to disk. So we wanted to take the locking out of the daemon and, and put it onto file locks to allow other tools beside it. Um, and originally, uh, the package formerly known as Docker Graph Driver Code was pulled out and put into a separate library, and that library is now called Container Storage. We've continued to en uh, enhance um, Container Storage to add new features, and I think I'll be talking about that later. So the next thing you do, so now I've Go onto a container registry, pull down the standard format using containers image, explode it onto disk using container storage. Now I need to execute the container. Well, the good thing is OCI, the second part of OCI was, was identifying um, the runtime specification. So again, what, what they've specified is basically describe what a rootFS looks like, and then they described a JSON data that you can put on disk, and, and any tool that can implement containers can now read that JSON file and figure out what the user expected to happen and then run a container on it. So that's what the OCI specification is. And run C was the default implementation of the runtime spec for all Linux containers. As of the package formerly known as Docker 1.11, Docker actually uses run C. So all the tooling I'm going to be talking about going forward is using the exact same container runtime to configure the Linux kernel to run these processes on the system. But because there's now a specification, other tools, other container runtimes, or people wanting to run containers in different ways have come along. So you see Run V and Clear Containers, which are basically both 
tools for running containers inside of virtual machines, inside of KVM, have come along. Okay, so you can actually run different type of container runtimes, and I believe Microsoft also has the way that they run containers on their system is using OCI specification for running it as well. This gives us alternatives to a Toby Reader. So now we can run containers using different types of runtime. Okay, we can basically get the same effect, but we can start to you know, look, look and run these containers in different ways. So now that we have these tools, so again, we took the big fat container daemon and we broke out the core components of it onto some, something the libraries that can be used and innovated at different rates. So that what we, my team's been working on over the last um, uh, year or so is basically how do we innovate on top of those? And we've been getting a decent amount of con contribution from the upstream. One of the things we wanted to do was simplify signing, so image signing. And we've been working very heavily on um, allowing PGP, a thing we call simple, simple signing. We wanted to have something much simpler than Docker Notary. So we felt that Docker Notary was very difficult to do and also tied people to a specific registry. We don't believe that there should be any tie, tying of container registry. We don't, you know, innovation in containers, a huge innovation has been happening at the container registry, right? Everybody has a registry. We have the atomic registry or the OpenShift registry. There's Docker I.O. There's CoreOS has their version of registry. Google has their version of registry. Amazon Cloud has their version of registry. Um, you know, so there's lots and lots of registry. Most of our customers are all using um, oh, Artifactory, okay, which is another registry. So there's lots and lots of these registries, but something like Docker Notary is about, all about tying you to a specific registry. But all people wanted was signing, all right? And we've been signing images called RPMs for 20 years. So we wanted to basically make the experience of signing images as simple as the experiences of signing RPMs, and that's what simple signing was all about. So multiple, what we want to do is allow multiple people to sign images at the same time. Signatures can be stored in an OpenShift registry, and signatures are totally separate from the registries, right? So you can put your signatures anywhere you want. You can put your container registries anywhere you want. When you download your registry, when you download a, a container image, it'll go out to a registry store or a signature store, download it, compare the two things. If they match, it's a signed image. If they don't match, they're not. And you set up the policy. You say, I trust Dan Walsh. If he signed this image, I trust that that image is secure, and you're in charge of it, right? It's totally isolated from it. So that's been put into signatures being stored on any web server, allow you to sign any content to Docker.io. Build policy rules engine to control which imaging registries you're trusted. So we have all this tooling all built into, um, right now it's built into the atomic tooling. It's built into, uh, oh, it's be, being built into OpenShift. Um, it's also going into other people are looking at it. Right now we're working potentially with third parties, major cloud vendors are looking at this rather than tying people to notary. So again, it's innovation, but it's innovations inside of the, the pulling and pushing of images, right? It's not innovation in the big fat demons. So we can actually do the innovation at the low level. There's a couple of videos when you get the presentation, you can watch the video on signing. So another interesting thing that we've been innovating on is a thing called system containers. And system containers, it's kind of a horrible name because it means everybody sees system containers and they think a different thing. What I think of a system container is, or when I think of containers, I'm thinking about a way of packaging software, right? So containers are a way of packaging software and then I pull it down and I run it. So I want to get my software from a container registry and I want to install it on the machine. If I want to pull down that container image to my machine and I want to run it, but I don't want to go through a big fat container daemon, I use a system image, okay? So a system image is just a way of pulling a container software from a remote repository, installing it on my machine and then running it. One of the ways I want to run it, I probably want to run it at boot time. So let's look at it. So on Atomic Host, so far it's shopped as, shipped as a container's image. Um, we had a use case where Kubernetes required etcd to be running and flannelD. So there's two services that are required to be running. Um, etcd and flannelD needed to start before your big fat container daemon, before the package formerly known as Docker. So we needed a way to download software installing on a machine inside of a container image and then have it running before the container runtime comes up and starts running. These containers can be run with read-only images, right? So I can download it. Well, I'm not expecting these tools to be out there mucking around with images. They're not doing builds, right? They're just going to download an image, run it, and launch it on the system. And then 
even if you wanted to, over, oh, Docker um, has no way of, of specifying priority. And the, the, the different efforts to specifying priority always are going to, you know, they're always going to fail and they're probably going to eventually, you know, evolve to something like uh, a NIC control, you know, sort of the system five NIC control where you specify priority numbers. And, um, but there's a really good tool on Linux for launching services on a system. It's called system D. So system D doesn't have problems with the priority, right? You can set up all sorts of really complex priorities and different ways of booting um, your system using system D. So what we wanted to do is take these container images off of a container registry, download them, and then use system D to basically set a priority for running them. So system containers. We have the atomic tool, you know, we can use, we use the atomic tool for installing system images, but all really the atomic tool is doing is wrapping up Scopio and a few other tools and creating a system D unit file for launching a container. So use Scopio to pull it from the registry. And then we store the images on top of OS tree. OS tree is really good for allowing us to have multiple images on the system um, and then not using up a hell of a lot of disk space. So we can actually use OS tree for storing these. And finally, uh, the atomic command creates a system D unit file and uses that, uses run C. Run C is actually optional here. I probably should change this slide. You don't have to run a container runtime or container tool for launching system D system uh, containers, right? A container is just a process in the system. If you wanted to just download a container image to load a kernel module, you download the image, you have a tool that basically chroots into where the image is and executes load, you know, uh, 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 mental blocking on the command, yeah, ins mod or, uh, uh, to, to load the kernel module. You don't need a container runtime. You don't need to be mucking around with containers to do that type of thing. So all, all I really want to do is get that container image blob, pull it down the system, store it somewhere, and then allow me to execute commands inside of it. If I want to run containers, I can use run C. Uh, see, optionally, we'll use run C to run the containers. But you can use to root. I don't care. It's up to you guys to determine the security. And people that are packaging these tools can actually go out and package them. So when I download and install, this is the command to install the SED container on the system, atomic install dash dash system SED. Goes out to a container registry, grabs the SED, pulls it down, sets up system D unit file, starts up the container, it's up and running. If I want to install flannel, same command. System D makes sure SED starts before flannel. System D makes sure that start, both of those start before the container runtime. So the packager can specify, you know, the, basically the criteria for starting up these system containers. Even the package formerly known as Docker is now being shipped inside of a system container. So there's nothing to say you can't ship a full big fat container daemon inside of a container. And that's really what, what's going on here. And you can actually, you know, install that. So with standalone containers, so I call them system containers, and then we sometimes call them standalone containers. So one of the things we're going to look forward to, and I think this is starting to happen in Fedora, is packaging up regular software, contain, you know, think about modules, inside of containers. So I want to basically, as we move forward, you're going to have a Fedora, say, 26, Fedora 27, Fedora 28, and someone's going to package up an application that has that runs inside of Apache. Okay, do I need a big container runtime if all I'm going to do is run that service listening on port 80? No. So we want to be, basically allow people to start packaging standardized software and run it on the system. I want to run Apache, but instead of installing it as an RPM, I want to install it as a container. It'll listen to port 80 on my host. It will use VWW on my host. But that Apache could be, I could be running a Fedora 28 system, but I might be running Fedora 26's version of Apache. And I can continue to run that forever, theoretically. Okay, so we want to basically start to break apart running of the host operating system from running individual applications on it. And I don't need to run everything inside of an orchestrated container. Daemons run as container standard ports, volumes, repackaged, packages of the apps as OCI images instead of RPM or in addition to a RPM. So things like MariaDB, Postgres SQL, Apache. Think about it, right? We can start to actually think about packaging these things as container images instead of all, you know, just RPMs. 
And as we move forward with modularity, this is the way you'll be able to have modularity and have multiple different applications running with different user spaces on the same machine at the same time without having to have some big container daemon managing the whole thing. So let's look at improved storage. I mentioned that earlier. One of the things we wanted to do with that storage is we wanted to have things like read-only container images. Right now, the way Docker works is not really good with read-only container images. So we wanted to have um, the big thing about read-only container images is it provides better security. Right now, everything in the Docker world is shipped with a copy on write file system underneath it, which means that if I hack into your system, if I take get control of your Apache, guess what? I can rewrite user has been HTTPD. If I had a read-only container running, then when I take over your Apache, I can't rewrite the executable that I'm running inside of. So I can get a good isolation between the two things. That means that I have to hack your machine, Apache every time it comes up, as opposed to leaving a back door where it became easier for me to attack it all the time. In production, my belief is in production, most applications should always run with read-only containers. Flash users should never be writable by processes inside of a container unless you are building containers. But because Docker ties together the ability to build as well as the ability to run, all the applications are underneath basically have the same, same um, security. So they all basically have a wide open. Anybody's allowed to write anywhere inside of a container image by default. I'd like to change that default going forward. So get rid of copy and write file systems when not needed. So let's talk about container image size. One of the big things, right? Everybody know heard about the Alpine, all right? And one of the things that Fedora right now, we have the Fedora minimum container image. So everybody's trying to shrink these container images all the time, right? And people come out and say, oh, my container image is only 80 megabytes. Oh, mine's 120 megabytes. Well, mine's better than yours because I have 40, I'm skinnier. So everything's about th thinning out container images. And the reason for that is when developers are working with container images, they're basically going out and pulling them, and they just don't want to wait that extra 10 seconds for the container image to come down. Right, so that's the whole idea of trying to shrink these container images. Um, but I would argue the real problem here is that we're moving these container images back and forth all over the place. So why do you care? Why can't we use shared file systems for storing our container images? Right, why do I have to go out and right, think, think about Kubernetes. It's going to come up. It's going to launch 100 containers on 100 different nodes. Each one of those containers is, say, a gigabyte in size. So it now goes out to 100 nodes. Each one of those nodes is going to have to move one gigabyte of data from a container registry to the, to the, to the node. OK, now we go two months later. There's a security vulnerability. We update the container image. And all of a sudden, all those nodes have to go out and move huge amounts of data again. Why are we doing that? If I'm running in an orchestrated environment, guess where my data is, sits in containers? It usually sits on local host storage. If I'm running in an orchestrated environment, that host storage is, has to be networked, right? So if I want to fail over from node A to node B, I probably have my data has to be stored on some kind of shared storage. It has to be an NFS, CEPS, cluster, iSCSI. Some way it has to be stored um, on disk. So the image is not being shared though, that way, but all the data is. So why, are we sh why aren't we using shared network storage for sharing our images? So we want instantaneous updates uh, for container images. So the, basically what we've done with container storage now is we allow you to store your images on NFS, cluster, CEPHs, okay? So in container storage now, we're allowed to do that, so you can actually set up your when we get to the final part of Cryo, um, or Kpod, or any of the other tools, Builder, all can have shared storage with NFS. So now if I go out and I'm running 100 containers underneath Kubernetes, they don't pull them down. They just do a mount of the NFS share, and all of a sudden the image is inside of the container. The image is ready for the container to run. All right, so we're moving images to container storage. So let's look at container image development tools. Why do we care how someone builds an OCI image? OCI images are standardized. Why do you care what kind of tools build it, right? Again, going back to my PDF description at the beginning, do you care that someone built it with Acrobat Reader? I mean, Acrobat Writer, or uh, Acro, yeah, Acrobat. 
do you care how that PDF was created? No, as long as it works, as long as it has the functionality you care, you, you, you know, when you're looking at it, why do you care how it was written? So four or five years ago when we first started using it, Docker came up with the concept of Docker file. The sad thing is, the same way we build containers now is the same way we built them four years ago. And people are jumping through hoops to try to figure out ways to get different activity to happen inside of a Docker file. So we have a standardized version, and Docker itself is called Docker file is a really crappy version of Bash. Right? It, you know, it, just, it just, you know, it, it works well for describing an application, but up to this point, the only way to build Docker images or OCI images is to do a Docker build. So can we have alternatives to the Docker file? Well, there's, there has been some tools have been coming. Has anybody played with Ansible containers? So Ansible is a way of describing an application inside of Ansible as opposed to describing inside of a, contain, uh, of a Docker file. And then there's OpenShift's S2I. So OpenShift S2I takes out Docker files altogether. It hides it all totally behind the scenes. And you basically do a git check-in. And as soon as you do a git check-in, some way OpenShift magically takes that information and creates a new Docker image or a new OCI image. So there are new ways of developing these. The problem is every one of these has to talk to the Docker daemon because the only way anybody's ever built container images is through the Docker daemon. So I want to be able to build container images without requiring a big fat daemon. And I talked to this man over here, Alan, at DevConf last year, and I said, hey, we're doing all this stuff with container storage. Could we build a container image with it? And this was on day one of it, and day two he got up at a a lightning talk and actually demonstrated building containers image without a containers registry. So that we created a thing. He made fun of the way I say the word builder, so it's builder. So we created a thing called uh, GitHub Project Atomic called Builder. But we basically the goal here was to use Bash as a way of building container images. So if I'm building a container, uh, really what I want to do is I want to build it from a base container. So I needed the from command. So if you look at a Docker file. You see the first command is you almost always build a, you know, is, is from Fedora or from something. So he built a command line tool called builder from um, Fedora. When I execute builder from Fedora, guess what it does? It uses container's image to go out to a registry, grab Fedora, pull it to the local machine, explode it on top of container storage, and creates a container ID. So as soon as I do that, the next command I can do is mount it. Right? I don't have to be going through a daemon. I don't have to be asking mother may I. What I can do is I can actually go out and mount it. So he added a command called build a mount. You give it the container ID and then give it a mount point. This is somewhat lying here, so we'll ignore that for now. Um, actually, what it does is it returns the mount point where it mounted it. If I want to run a command inside of the container image that I'm building, so if I want to do the equivalence of a run command inside of a Docker file, I can do a build a run. So I can do a build a run of the container and I can do DNF install. What that will do is actually use run C to create a container on top of my image and we'll run DNF inside of it. So it'll be locked down. If I want to control what's going on, I can do that. But if I've done the build a mount, I can actually just do a make install with the destructor of the mount point. Right? There's nothing special about these container images. They're just disk space. If it's mounted up, I can copy con content correct directly in. I can do DNF install, install root there. So one of the problems with Docker file, Docker file right now is I have to have all my tools inside of the Docker image to be able to build. So when we're looking at minimizing the size of container images, one of the big things is I got to have DNF in it. DNF requires Python. So I have these big tools that are poured into my container. If all I want to run is Apache, but I have to have Python and DNF and all these other tools inside of the container. It's bloating it up. It's also increasing the attack surface. So if I built my container using the host machine as opposed to building inside of the container, I can actually start to you know, shrink the requires, requirements of tools inside of it. When I'm done, I need to commit the image. Right? So I'm building a container. I'm modifying an existing image, and I need to commit it. Commit it. So this is a build a commit command. And I can actually specify all sorts of command line tools. So all those other flags that are inside of the Docker file, we can actually spe specify it on the command line. So with Builder, I can actually do the entire build 
basically, Malin has implemented every single command that you would expect to see inside of a Docker file that you can execute inside of a bash script, okay, with no container daemon in the way. So there's no container daemon causing any problems in this environment. Yep. Well, well, all right, so, well, again, the daemon actually causes everybody to go in and work in the same type of environment. So in the daemon, problems with the daemon are the locking, so there's no, there's, I can't access the storage without going through the daemon. I can't get any new features into the, into the way I want to deal with the tools without going through the daemon. So if I want to build a tool that does special things like mounting, I have to get that daemon to agree to be able to mount these things to external storage. All right, so, I, the, so the real goal here is just to, it's sort of, a, I, don't, I don't want to say this because everybody always says, oh, that's what System D does. But basically we want to break things apart into core components and then be able to innovate and use the core components separate from the big centralized daemon. Okay? So we want, uh, right now, Ansible Container and OpenShift are both looking into using Builder as a method for building it. We've also dealt with several companies that are looking at, at streaming con continuous builds. Turns out Builder is a lot faster for building because Builder only commits once, or you control how often Builder commits. When you're using a Docker file, every single line has to be committed. So if you look at Docker file, you'll see all these people doing these huge run lines with you know backslashes and stuff because they want all these commands to be executed at the same time inside of the build environment. In Builder, we've taken that apart and basically allowed you to do individual steps as you do in Builder. So you can basically say, uh, yeah, that's good enough. I'm going to commit now, and then I can continue adding to it. Or you can just do everything in you know one huge you know hundred line script and commit at the end. If you look at some of the JBoss applications, they have 50. 75 layers end up being added when they run with Docker, Docker builds. So if you run a builder building, um, you can actually really shrink and speed up because uh, you're not adding a layer for every single command. So what about Docker file? Yep. Yep. You define it as a bash script instead of a Docker file. Yeah, I mean, a Docker file is just a bad bash script, right? Yeah, yeah so. I wasn't sure if it yeah. turns out there's some help for right. the file. No, no, we're not doing anything. I mean, that's, if someone wants to innovate on top of Builder, they can do that. So Builder, what about Docker files? Everybody in the world's working with Docker files, so one of the things we had to do with Builder is actually support Docker file format. So we created a Builder build using Docker file dash F Docker file dot. But that's kind of a lot of characters to type, so we actually called it bud. So build a bud dash F Docker file basically allows you to build, to, to, it'll work, walk through the entire Docker file and run it exactly like you did a Docker build. So if you have a lot of applications that people are submitting, like uh, at the Fedora, we were at the Fedora container talk yesterday and they were talking about people submitting Docker files and then, them building them inside of Docker, uh, Fedora registries. One of the things we asked at the end is, are you looking at Builder for doing it? You're looking, and yes, the answer was yes. So they're going to look at using Builder for building container images. Theoretically, at some point in the future, Builder might allow us to get better security than using Docker Build. Okay, we might be able to use Docker Build with less privileges than we require right now to do building. But right now, it requires sysadmin privileges. So. Build is kind of a really cool tool. But there was a real goal in this whole thing was to, so we wanted to basically not require the Docker daemon. So guess what? I've been insulting big fat container daemons, and guess what I'm about to introduce? A somewhat thinner big fat container daemon. So container management. So now going back to Kubernetes. Kubernetes wants to support more than one container runtime. So Kubernetes, uh, about year and a half ago, CoreOS went to Kubernetes. If you looked at Kubernetes up to a year and a half ago, it basically had Dockerisms all through it. So it was talking the Docker Engine's uh, API to, the, to build out, do all its stuff. CoreOS went to them and said, we want to have Rocket running inside of containers. 
Okay, so we need to have rocket and static containers. So here's a huge patch that they basically said, if def, you know, the equivalent in Go of if def docker do this command, if def else do this rocket command. And Cora, uh, Google and the Kubernetes people said, hold on, we can't do this. We can't have everybody, you know, uh, you know end up with Go code with like 4,000 different if then else statements. And so what they did is they said, we're gonna define the API that we expect a container runtime to implement if they want to work as a container runtime for Kubernetes. And that was called CRI. So, uh, container runtime interface. And I'll spell that out. So, when they defined the CRI for Rocket, we jumped in and said, hey, why don't we build a little tiny tool, a daemon, that just implements the CRI interface and launches containers for Kubernetes. So if you look at another thing in Kubernetes, Kubernetes has had an incredible problem staying up with Docker, okay? Docker changes all the time, especially last year, right? There was Docker 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, all within a series of few months. Every single release broke Kubernetes. Matter of fact, Kubernetes right now only supports Docker 1.12, which has been out for almost a year. They haven't moved to Docker 1.13 yet. Docker now has changed their whole thing when they went, changed the name to Moby. They've changed so they release on a monthly basis now. So this is the 17, you know, 17 6 release. I don't know, even know what the latest release is, right? But every single release, they broke Kubernetes. So we said, why don't we implement a container runtime daemon that will guarantee to never break Kubernetes? And the way we want to do that is we want to have the container daemon, any pull request, any change to CRI, oh, has to pass the Kubernetes test suite. It's the CRI test suite, the end-to-end -end test suite. So we started creating a thing called uh, CRYO, which stands for Container Runtime Interface for Open Container Initiative, OCI, okay? So we, inter we introduced it last year. It's underneath the Kubernetes uh, runtime. Implements K Kubernetes run Container Runtime Interface. Kubernetes service launches container pods. Uh, this is fully open with contributors from Red Hat, Suzy, Intel, Hypershell, IBM, and lots of other people contributing to it, okay? I call it a lot, there's a whole bunch of people that are like dogs sniffing around the edge of it right now. We're hearing from everybody that's interested in it. Whether or not they're willing to contribute, I don't know. But there's lots of, every big major company you can think of that has anything to do with containers, other than the Docker I.O., other than Docker, right now is interested in cryo, right? Intel added support for Cryo to run KVM-based containers, clear containers. If you go to cryo.io slash blog right now, you'll see I published today a contain Intel uh, blog talking about how they run Intel containers, clear Linux containers under Cryo. Pack Cryo package is now available for Fedora 25, 26, Rawhide, all the Fedora versions, and Fedora is where we've been delivering all this stuff first. Everything comes in Fedora first. Uh, but we're also working on getting it onto Ubuntu and other packages. Um, and it's the first CRI-based daemon to pass the full Kubernetes CRI end-to-end -end test. Okay, our test, when you commit a, right now our test, when you can commit uh, a pull request, or you send a pull request to a container, it launches hundreds of tests. As a matter of fact, it takes between an hour and two hours for the entire test suite. So you are not allowed to, until you pass all those tests, we're not, we're not, um, accepting the pull request. So you have to pass all tests to get it in. And again, it has to be because we can't break Kubernetes. Kubernetes is what matters. So everybody know who Kelsey Hightower is? Kelsey Hightower is sort of the, the lead evangelist for Kubernetes, and he has a massive following of 35,000 followers. He's just huge uh, influence. So last week, uh, he announced that as of this Friday, I guess, or Friday the 31st, a huge update for Kubernetes, the hardware ship. So he basically talks all the time about Kubernetes and all new labs, including encrypted secrets and the using of cryo as a container interface is what he's about to ship. And look at the first person that chimed in underneath it, Solomon Hikes. And he's not happy about this. And one of the things that cryo when we started developing Cryo did is it created a thing called Container D. So originally, Cryo was basically an alternative to the Docker daemon, and if you look at the way Kubernetes worked with the Docker daemon, it goes out to the Docker daemon, the Docker daemon pulls down the image, 
stores it inside of its internal memory, um, and then launches run C. That's the way Docker Daemon worked. So Docker, as of 1.11 or 1.12, added this thing originally called the Container D, Container D. Container D was tied to Swarm, Docker Swarm, a competitor against Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes, so Container D was because Docker was too heavyweight, so they wanted to have a thinned down Container D in that worked. So you, all of a sudden, Docker went from Docker launching Run C to Docker talking to Container D and Container D launching Run C. Um, actually, if you go back further, Docker used to launch Container directly and then move to Run C and then move to Container D Run C. So all of a sudden, Container D was out there, but it was part of the Docker project. After Cryo started getting a lot of press last fall, Docker decided to add more functionality to the Container Daemon. So they created a thing called Container, they created a project called Container D that was separate from Docker. That Container D, they then took all the functionality that we were doing in Cryo, right, the separate containers image, containers, and, and, and moved that into the Container Daemon. So now if you talk to the Container Daemon, it will go out to a Container Registry, pull it down, um, it will put it onto storage and stuff. We've been asked to contribute to that, and the first thing we did is, sure, we'll contribute to that. Let's uh, use Containers Image as a way of pulling images. Let's use Container Storage as a way of pulling storage. And they said, no, we're not interested. They also tied it to what's called the BDFL, which is a Benevolent Dictator for Life. And guess who the Benedict Dictator for Life is? Solomon Hikes. So we basically said, we want to separate all this functionality and have different libraries that we can innovate at different rates. They turned it down. And so what Docker is trying to do is get everybody to move to Container D. So Container D and Cryo are the two competitors in this environment, and that's what's going on. But Container D is also a daemon for supporting Swarm, Mesosphere, Kubernetes, any other Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes along and wants to do container registries is supposed to go into that. So guess what it's doing? It's going to blow up into a big fat container daemon. We built a container daemon that's dedicated just to, to Kubernetes. We'll see who wins. One of the things when we're building up Cryo, that one of, the, one of the problems with moving from Docker as a backend for Kubernetes is if you use Kubernetes right now and you have want to find out what's going on in the system, what do you do? You would get onto that the node that's running Kubernetes and you start to run Docker commands. So you start to run different Docker commands to sort of diagnose what's going on and really to sort of understand what's going on behind the scenes in Kubernetes environment. So we needed a, basically a debugging tool for doing that. So we started out this effort inside of Cryo called Kpod. So Kpod is a management tool for manage, administering Cryo storage and pods. So we've added Kpod diff, Kpod export, Kpod history, Kpod images, Kpod info, Kpod inspect, Kpod load, Kpod ps. Anybody notice any trend here that knows Docker? OK. So what we're doing is we're implementing the entire Docker CLI in Kpod without a big fat daemon. So again, this happens all, you don't even need cryo running. This happens behind the scenes and you're able to do almost everything you can do inside of a Docker CLI, but you're not talking to a daemon. It's not a client server operation, you're just running the containers as a child of your Kpod environment. So this is how far we are with Kpod right now. We have all these commands are implemented. Uh, we're probably adding about one command a week you go on to um, cryo.io slash blog, um, you'll find lots and lots of blogs that talk and, and videos showing you how we're implementing it. We haven't implemented the most important ones yet because they're the hardest to do. Kpod run, Kpod exec, Kpod attach. Those are all being worked on heavily, um, but we really want to make sure we're doing them correctly. Once we have Kpod, we want to, we're actually creating a new library called LivePod, which Kpod and Cryo will end up sharing and be able to do all of the activity through the same, same interface. And if you want to, um, so Kpod originally, when it comes out, is just going to be tied to what the Docker CLI can do, but we really want to get to the point where it's actually launching pods. And we want to get more experimenting around what does it mean to be in a pod. So when I'm talking about pods, for those that don't know, are basically a way of running more than one container in the same environment. So Docker, uh, Kubernetes basically says, I run, Kubernetes runs pods, not containers. But you can run a single container inside of a pod, so it ends up being you know, almost everybody tends to do that. But you can actually have like uh, other containers that sort of monitor the, what's going on with the main container inside of a pod. You can have what's called init containers. 
you can start to run potentially containers with different privileges inside of a pod environment, and the pods move around you know, from node to node. You can't run, contain pods cannot span nodes, but, but the pod becomes a single unit which can, which can run one or more containers inside of it. So we want to experiment with kpod into that environment once we have the entire Docker CLI implemented. So cryo next steps. We want to move it out of the Kubernetes incubator project. So we're, we're working very hard to get that. We want to get our 1.0. Um, so Kubernetes 1. Uh, Cryo 1.0 is going to be tied to Kubernetes 1.7. After we get our 1.0 release, and this is because the engineers want to have a 1.0 release, from then on, every Cryo release will be the exact same version as Kubernetes. So the Cryo that supports 1.8 is going to be 1.8. So Cryo 1.8 will be Kubernetes 1.8. Cryo 1.9 will work with Kubernetes 1.9. So we will have them matched up. The only one that breaks that is you have to have a 1.0 release. At least they want to. Uh, we need to pass the OpenShift test suite. So right now we're tying. Right now we're tied onto Kubernetes, but we also want to tie into OpenShift. So eventually we want to get to the point where Cryo won't be updated unless you fix that. Unless your patch will not break Kubernetes or OpenShift. OpenShift tells Kubernetes to execute a pod. Kubernetes communi communicates with Cryo. Cryo uses container's image to pull the image to the host. Cryo stores the image using container storage. Cryo then runs, launches the pod using run C, or as the blog today tells you, it can use it. It can run uh, using clear containers. Standard-based container runtimes, alternative to the package formerly known as Docker and Rocket. Conclusion, breaking up container runtimes into core functionality, pulling and pushing images from registries, storing images, Running containers, innovate new and interesting ways of using containers, and the end is PDF Linux containers. Any questions? Everybody understands thoroughly. Yes, Matt. So, uh, just say it's on my laptop. I do have it on my laptop. I'm not really uh, being consistent towards Kubernetes and Linux. Yeah. Well, when Cryo has when Cryo has full, so the the question I guess I should repeat the question. The question is: Is Cryo interesting to sort of a, a person who just wants to use the Docker CLI? So, right. So he just wants to play with containers on his local host. He doesn't understand orchestration. Doesn't want to worry about orchestration. Just wants to sort of launch containers and play with them. Our goal with the Kpod tool is to actually give you that experience. So you can have Kpod as being a way. So you can be able to do all of the. All of the Docker CLI that anybody uses, you'll be able to execute with Kpod. So you can install Cryo, not run the Cryo daemon, but use the Kpod tool. Eventually, we might break a pod Kpod away from Cryo, but right now it's it's sort of tied together for. But and you can use Builder at the same time. So if you want to build container images on your host, you can use Builder. Builder to build it. As soon as Builder's done building it, you can do Kpod run to run a container in it. You can. Use Scopio then to copy those images out to a registry. You can use build to push. You can use Scopio uh, Kpod push. So all the tools have all the ability to, to interact with. Yeah. Right. So so the advantage is that you have lots of flexibility in the tools that you can use. You mean advantage over using Docker Daemon? Yeah. yeah. It, well, I, I think eventually. I mean, the advantage is that you could, yeah, you could fire a cryo daemon, and cryo daemon would instantaneously they see the images you want. So you can go right into a Kubernetes and say, "Launch this container I just built," and it'll already be inside the storage. But yeah, I mean, there's no, there's, I think there are advantages because we're innovating at different levels in, in the different tools. But yeah, overall, it's it's the goal is to make it a sort of a placement. Yeah, same experience. Uh, our goal with the Kpod is to uh, to give you muscle memory. So if you typed in you know, TI for the way you launch a container with Docker, you will type in Kpod run TI for launching Canary. We're, we're taking the exact, almost exactly the same API. Things you won't be able to do is you're not going to be allowed to do Docker. You won't have Kpod swarm. You know, we're not going to implement, you know, implement that. If someone else wants to implement that, we're fully open to accepting patches from anybody that wants to do that. Some companies have contacted us and they want to use pods without using Kubernetes. So they're looking at us using libraries for pods to, to run, run underneath it. So we're open to that. Again, this is, our goal here is not to be a BDFL. This is not going to be Red Hat's 
only way of doing it. Red Hat has not decided whether we're going to support Claire containers or other containers, but anybody who wants to contribute, it's a fully open source project. So anybody that comes in and contributes gives us good reason to have it or makes lots of contributions, we will accept accepted it. Anybody else? Any other questions? I'm out of time anyways. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. And hopefully, uh, anybody want to contribute? At the end of it, these are all the different places, right? Instead of just having one centralized location, you can contribute to containers image, container storage, atomic project, builder, scopio, cryo, there's blogs, mediums, things like that. So thanks for coming. <laughs>